thanks for this invitation to talk today. So I've slightly changed my topic, it's called On Religiosity and Commercial Life, a post humanist critique of the post-human cultural economy. Now the knotty issue that I would like to address concerns the ties of divine religion to commercial life in the current era of globalisation. There is general agreement among scholars of globalisation that President Nixon's decision to sever a link between dollar and gold in 1971 in order to pay for the Vietnam War marked a turning point in the political and economic history of global capitalism. The decision set in motion a train of events that have called into question cherished assumptions about our place in the world and how we should act in it. It has been a confusing time for anthropologists as we have had to struggle to comprehend the paradoxes and dilemmas posed by economic developments in the finance industry that have unified the globe and contrary political movements that have divided it up into warring micro-national polities based on ever finer ethnic and religious divisions. The communication revolution, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89, the global financial crisis in 2008, and the global flows of people and money set in motion by these events has transformed social and familial relations, creating transnational families and untold wealth here, estrangement and extreme poverty there. These questions have posed anew the questions of where and how to do field work. The growing, the growing popularity of Wall Street as a site of ethnographic research is a sign of these changing times. But it poses the question of whether we go to do research in brackets Ho 2009 or do protest in brackets Greater 2008. Is it sufficient for us to represent, quote unquote, the native point of view? or should we now start to critique it? These political disagreements have their basis in a critique of a secular humanist agenda of classical anthropology. This has been called into question over the last four decades as agency theory has developed and evolved. The paradox of agency theory is that the very attempt to attribute agency to humans as to things has turned people into victims as intentionality and motivations were attributed to things. This animistic assumption is one of the defining characteristics of post-human thought and has become a dominant paradigm in the social sciences. In this respect, Knight shares common ground with Marx, Keynes and Weber. But the question is, why does a post-humanist cultural economy single out Weber and Knight and sideline Marx, Keynes and Jevons and Friedman. So these, the Jevons and Friedman and other free market anarchists are explicitly excluded because they deny the brute fact of uncertainty. This denial means that you post-humanists correctly argue that the predictive models of the economy are akin to that of the astrologer and magician. And in that sense, they're against this line of thought in modern financial capitalism. Marx and Keynes are excluded because cultural economy takes the perspective of the post-1970 free market entrepreneur, not that of the worker or the statesman who wants to regulate markets. Post-human cultural economy then is a form of free market economics, but one that distinguishes itself from other varieties of free market economics in that I argue that all entrepreneurs face the brute fact of uncertainty, that prediction is possible in the commercial world or any world for that matter. I quote, whether we choose to enhance the economic theory of the agent or denounce it, in both cases we formulate the same critique. Homo economicus is pure fiction. This introduction, as well as the entire book, maintains the consciousness. Go on speaking. Yes, Homo economicus really does exist. Of course he exists in the form of many species and his lineage is multiple and ramified. He is formatted, framed and equipped with a prothesis which hold him in his calculations, which are for the most part produced by economics. Suddenly new horizons open up to anthropology. It is not a matter of giving a soul back to a dehumanized agent, nor of rejecting the very idea of its existence. The objective may <coughs> be to explore the diversity of calculating agencies, forms and distributions. The market is no longer that cold, implacable, personal monster which imposes its laws and procedures. 
It is a many-sided, diversified, evolving device to which social sciences as well as actors themselves contribute to configure. In other words, here then, we're getting the idea as a mark as a warm, fuzzy, personal thing inhabited by human and non-human agents. My next section, I'll now look at post-human economy is the negation of the negation. It is clear from the preceding discussion that post-humanist approach to the question of why of the relationship between religion and commercial life has involved a re-evaluation of some ideas in the history of economic and anthropological thought. Some ideas are affirmed, others negated. Insofar as anthropology is concerned, they negate Malinowski's denial of the existence of homo economicus and the simple argument of Malinowski's followers that formalist thought is a unified discipline that has maintained unchanged since time. The post humanists also negate the argument advanced by Dumont and others that religion and the economy are opposed in the West, but not among the rest. They also negate the very idea that the West can be opposed to the rest on the grounds that the recent history, on the grounds that the recent history of globalization has swept away any previous legitimacy to this argument. Post humanists also negate what they call capitalism with a capital K, the simple minded and unresearched image that anthropologists have of economy in the West. <clears throat> the counter argument is that the the global world of today is an extremely complicated, historically evolving network of human and non-human agents whose social and religious interactions demand long-term research of an ethnographic, geographic and historical kind because, before it can be understood. In short, that field work in Wall Street is needed before we can pontificate about it. This is an argument that no ethnographer can deny. <coughs> um, and the economic contribution of members of the cultural autonomy school to understanding finance must be acknowledged. But, I notice in brackets too, no ethnographer can deny that studies of the Occupy movement too are needed and indeed have been done. David Gray. It's important to note that cultural economy is not a new subfield of economic anthropology. To the contrary, it's a new transdisciplinary paradigm that includes anthropology um, along with history, geography, sociology, finance, accounting, and economics, among others. This new paradigm rehabilitates Homo economicus, but in a radically new guise, with a new terminology, a modified utility theory of value, and a refurbished conceptual framework. <coughs> Probability and possibility, he says, have become dangerously confused. Probability is bad, possibility is good. Um, they are opening up the door to myriad schemes, scans, and resources. The future of anthropology is a critical discipline, he concludes, must be an ethics of possibility grounded in Nikean uncertainty. Now, this is an extraordinary proposition for a number of reasons. Firstly, when one looks at the millions of transactions that occur on a daily basis on Wall Street, how is one supposed to distinguish between the vicious profits made by the, the magicians with their ethics of probability from the virtuous profits made by the trader informed by mighty wisdom and the ethics of possibility? Note once again the use of denunciation and moral judgment. Those economists who deny uncertainty use magic and hence are bad, and the moral high ground is occupied by the high priests of the free market, like might, who face up to the brute fact of uncertainty. Hagarai does not seem to be aware of the assumption of the omniscient economic agent that informs life work. The spirit of capitalism he finds in is in the performative agency of Knight's omniscient economic agents, whose invisible non-human hands ensure public goods. And once we see this, the great the bar between him and Calon disappears. The third question of his proposition rises as if profit is reward for paying for facing uncertainty, then the question is who pays the reward? If profit is reward for facing uncertainty, who pays the reward? This is not a question he addresses. In the state of business as usual, financial trading is a zero sum game with winners and losers. But when there is a crisis such as the global financial crisis, the real answer emerge. It is the subprime borrower. This fact is documented 
uh, into pressing detail in the final report of the National Commission on the Causes of the Financial and Economic Crisis in the United States, online, 2011. When major these changes were made profitable for banks to securitize loans, they were able to extend newfound credit that suited prime rates, i.e. high rates, to subprime borrowers, i.e. those with a bad credit history. This set off a boom in housing prices. The wealth effect enabled some prime borrowers to refinance their houses and further contribute to, contribute to the boom in housing prices. When the bus came in 2008, the subprime borrower was a victim, many of course who live in Spain and Greece. The lives have devastated and will take years for them to recover. Meanwhile, the profits of financial traders have tripled and large bonuses to executives are still being paid once again. The Paderice book makes no mention of this historical fact, even though it was published in 2013. This omission would be no better illustration of the fact that post-human cultural economy is concerned primarily with agent see the superprime traders and their fetishized objects rather than the victims of subprime borrowers. Indeed, the word victims have come to boo with the rise of agency theory. It is, of course, perfectly legitimate for cultural economy to restrict itself to the perspective of the superprime entrepreneur. But it is one thing for an ethnographer like Hiro Miyazaki to represent the financial traders' point of view, as he must, uh, but it's quite another for a tertiary level theorist for a panorama to adopt the super prime terrorist position as his own and to base a moral philosophy of anthropology upon it. His, his post human ethics of possibility has Knight's divine omniscient being at the centre, one whose performative agency is to return virtuous profits to the mighty entrepreneur at whatever cost the subprime borrower, the worker, or the taxpayer. From the perspective of the subprime borrower, the, this allegedly omniscient superprime being is a, is a maleficent devil. The subprime borrower of today faces the certainty loss, the certainty of loss rather than the uncertainty of profit. The risk they observed is that the class makes the risk that Beck talked about, and it's very interesting. The Beck says that the, I'll jump over that, the, uh, um, basically the rich can buy themselves out. And categorise ethics of possibility is a superprimer's super dream but a subprimer's nightmare. His vision for a post-human anthropology dehumanises the subprime population and elevates the agency of the superprime populace of position to one of absolute uncertainty, supremacy. In this, in this respect, his analysis of the minor variation of the theoretical agenda of Cologne and collaborators in the cultural economy paradigm. It uncritically represents the voice of the plutonomy uh, against the precariat. <clears throat> there is some hope I see for anthropology because uh, agency theories outside of the cultural economy are beginning to realise that their one side of concern with the performativity of agents has blinded them to the precarity of precarity patients. This opened their eyes to new questions about such as how does an unspeakable population make its claims? This means taking the victims of the, the perspective of the subprime victims of the global financial crisis who pay the rewards of the multi entrepreneur. Now, so it seems to me that the post human cultural economy has an absolute cons conception of human and non human nature, and they don't look at the relationships. Now, the, so what post human cultural economy? Seems to be the spirit of modern capitalism in the form of animated things that is intentionally intentionality and non human motivations. I've perceived to be the invisible hand of high finance in an era of post 1970s globalisation. Post human cultural autonomy then is not a critique of globalisation, it's a sentiment of it. I just have a postscript to finish mm -hmm. on the grounds of a new debate. The tool's thought may be theological, but that is not the root cause of the problem. To the contrary, the common ground for the debate within the academy was established by the ordained United Church Militant, <coughs> the renowned literary critic, Walter Fry. The literary critic, uh, like the historian, Fry argued, is compelled to treat every religion in the same way that uh, religions treat each other. 
That is, as though they were human hypotheses, whatever else you may uh, like to think on other occasions. This statement, when generalised to include the anthropologist Elder Therapy Thomas, can provide the grounds for agreement on which respectful disagreement can proceed. Since me, try identifies a fundamental assumption of the economy and one that post human fundamentalists are reluctant to accept.
1990s, the anthropologist Roy Andrade took a year off from teaching in order, among other things, to read from cover to cover every issue of every major journal in anthropology as it was published. It's a true story. <laughs> At the end of this exercise, he determined that like journalists, anthropologists now just wanted to be where the action is. Everyone wanted to study whatever happened in the news when they settled on their project, or, for the lucky few, to succeed in anticipating where the news would be when they were ready to start publishing their research. Without some counterweight of a disciplinary sense of our own strengths, a sense that theoretical ambition certainly helps to cultivate, it's hard to avoid running around like this, chasing rather than making news, even if you chase it all the way to the Plutonomy's point of view, about which you want a moment. Second, I'm happy to sit down with Chris to, sell, to tell sad stories of the lives of things. After network theory and other post-humanist positions do aim in some ways to theorize the new worlds we've learned to find. This, I think, is the reason for their current vogue in the theoretical field that sometimes feels distressingly like they have almost completely to themselves. But too often, I think, their heavily moralized nominalism means they end up being more descriptive than anything else. These theories make it easy to travel in the vast diverse spaces we find we want to cover, but they do not, on my reading anyway, do enough to explain them, much less to provide a critical vantage point on them. There's more to say here, but Chris has already said so many important things on this topic that I'll leave it for now. I just wanted to situate the post-humanist moment in the broader story I'm trying to tell, as something like a theory for our new worlds, but not perhaps one of the theories we most need, and anyway, not the only one that we should want. The third point I want to make in situating Chris's argument falls from an aspect of his paper I found very striking. This is his diagnosis of, the range, of a range of theorists as outgrowths of the various perspectives or points of view from which he says they see the world. Thus we have Marx speaking from the place of the worker, Keynes from that of the statesman, Weber from that of the entrepreneur, and a Potteri of the other new cultural economists from that of the super profit trader. This conceit leads to one of Chris's major conclusions, again, slightly more robust than the, than the written version. And this conclusion is that we also need to learn from the position of the precarious patients of the contemporary world, the people for whom, if objects really do have some agency, it's usually at the expense of their own. I wholly endorse the political passion that informs this point, but I do want to ask if the best way for us as anthropologists to act on it is to focus on the sense in which theory is always made from some point of view. This is surely true, but it may not always be the most important thing to say about theory, as admittedly it has often been during precisely the period in which anthropological theory has been in relative eclipse. One place Chris gets the language of point of view is, of course, Malinowski's injunction to get the native's point of view. But there's always been a tension in anthropology between this position, which we teach all our students almost from the first day we encounter them, and another perhaps most clearly articulated by Levi Strauss, that learning the native point of view is just the beginning of our work. The point is to go beyond it. We went beyond it. What we went beyond it to was something that theorists usually used to figure as a whole of some sort, greater than but able to encompass or even explain the various points of view it generated in those people who live their lives in relation to it. You might think about this kind of whole in relation to the Kenneth Burkean ironic ball that uh, that uh, Michael Carruthers was talking about. Theories built around such holes sometimes define themselves as anti-humanists, and it would be a good, good task for someone to set out how this anti-humanism was different from, but may have influenced the post-humanism Chris so productively critiques. But in any case, we don't theorize holes anymore, and it is in their place that we have things, animate things, and bodies, and networks, and phenomenologies, not to mention the ontologies that are these days such noisy, but also often etiolated versions of the holes we have lost. My point is not that we should go back to an older holism. I doubt we could if we wanted to, given the strength of the intellectual torrents that washed it away. But we might want to shift, sift the rubble those torrents left behind a little more carefully to ask why we anthropologists were so theoretically effective during our holist era. Maybe we would find amongst it some hints about how to learn to theorize again in a way that does not leave us chasing after wherever the action is now and taking the point of view of whomever appears to be in charge when we get there. This is the task Chris's tour de force puts me in mind of in any event. And I would close by echoing one of its most forceful clarion calls in terms I've just laid out. I think it's only if we regain our own theoretical voices, 
Our voices in which we speak precisely from the point of view of the anthropologist that we can contribute effectively